Uh, I'm Steve Lechner. I'm a product manager on our log management team. And there's a couple very exciting developments in our product that I'd like to introduce you to today with a story. This is Kevin. Kevin is a new SRE in a large organization with um, very many developer teams. Uh, he walks into uh, the office one day and he sees a Slack message in his channel that tells him, hey, there's a lot of 500 responses coming from one of your services that you own. And uh, well, here's a link. Why don't you click on it to investigate further? So he clicks on it and it brings him to this view of his log explorer, which shows him the count of all of the status 500 logs across all of his many services for all of his many developer teams. Uh, and clearly, one of them has some sort of count of 500s issue happening right now. So he clicks on it, and he sees that option to view the logs. He clicks through that. It brings him to ultimately a, uh, an, an actual example of a 500 response uh, that's, that's, that's happening right now for one of, these, one of his services. And that, that particular 500 log isn't really telling him all that he needs to know in order to investigate. So he clicks on service, and that see trace in APM option, which brings him to this view, it's a, uh, the, uh, the actual trace of the request that ultimately generated his, log, his 500 response. Uh, so this is that, that flame graph there is showing uh, for every function that contributes to the, the whole request path, showing the time taken, uh, you'll notice there's three of them or so that have this little red icon. Uh, and those are the ones that, are, that have some sort of error happening. And he clicks on the error tab at the very bottom. You can see that uh, he can actually find the trace back that is uh, contributing to the, the, the fact that this is resulting in a 500. Um, now, from this view, he can, he can identify, is this a customer-facing issue? Uh, and he can prioritize just how urgent it is. He can, from the code that he sees is airing out, he can identify maybe what team he needs to, uh, to loop into the investigation. The point being that this investigative flow that Kevin was able to accomplish here was very smooth. And, and there's actually two tricks that he employed here that made that smooth investigative flow possible. And those are the two, the two uh, tricks that I want to, to, uh, to sort of focus on today and sort of unpack. Uh, the first of those steps that he took was this one here. The, from a log event, an interesting log event, he was able to jump to the request that had generated that log event. Um, that see trace and APM. Now, how is this possible? It's really because Kevin's organization is taking advantage of a new feature that Datadog offers for deep linking your log events, their log events rather, with their traces. Now, before uh, Kevin's organization used Datadog, they actually really tried to make this deep linking uh, of their log events with their traces and really correlate them together. They were able to do, to do that at a high level uh, based on what, what's, what host the, the, um, the, the log came from and the, the request was, was happening on, what, what service. Um, but actually linking together the, their logs with their, the, the actual requests that generated their logs uh, was something very difficult for them to do. It involved like instrumenting all of their code to pass in some sort of identifier string into their logs and then coming up with a protocol that uh, uh, would, would work across services as the, the request jumped from service to service. Um, so that way every service could catch that request ID and pass it into their logs as well. And getting all of their teams to, to comply with that protocol, it was, it was all a mess. Uh, just a lot of effort. Fortunately, they were able to take advantage of a new feature that Datadog now offers where Datadog with its, distributive trace, with its distributed tracing libraries can actually inject the trace ID and span IDs uh, into the logs that their code generates. So with this, and what, what was the setup process for them? Uh, instead of actually having to instrument any of their code, it was the same setup process that they had for enabling APM uh, to begin with, these guys are these folks are Java users, so uh, that was installing the Java client, instrumenting with the their application with the the auto instrumentation method of the the Java jar file. The only thing they had to change to get this log injection thing to happen uh, was to add an, a new environment variable for DD logs injection. So sort of a switch that they flipped on. What was the benefit that came about as a result of this? Um, well, we already went through the one flow of being able to go from interesting log event to trace that uh, of, of the request that actually generated the log event. But 
Kevin could have done a couple other things. He could have, from that log event, uh, actually just queried across all of the other logs that share the same trace ID and just seen the full story of all of the logs that are generated by the same request, regardless of whether they came from you know, this file or that file, maybe that container. Wherever they came from, they were all part of the same request story. From there, potentially, he could have pivoted to, from maybe the, the URL path of what was being queried on, he could have pivoted to the browser logs to see what are some of the, the front end uh, context around the, the back end 500 that he's investigating. Um, or if he were taking a, a, an investigative path from, say, uh, the APM side originally, once he gets down to a trace, he can actually capture, he can actually jump into the full context of this request, not just the spans and, and how much time is taken and the, the success of each span, each function. He can actually jump over to that logs tab to get that full story of all of the logs that were generated by this request there in the same view. And so any variable that might be getting logged uh, from, their, from the code, he actually has access to that in the same view as the entire uh, flame graph. So that was the first of the two tricks that Kevin was able to employ in order to have that smooth investigative process. Uh, the second trick that he used was this one right here, where he was able to go from a, a monitor alert to a query of all of the 500s, a count of all the 500s across his entire organization, regardless of what service generated them or what team owned that code. And there again, remember Kevin's situation, he's a new SRE at a large organization that has dozens of teams. Now there's Actually, for that kind of organization, this sort of cross-team aggregated query would have been very difficult to accomplish. Why? Because there would have been three, uh, three problems blocking the way of this happening. Uh, the first being that there are many sources of HTTP logs. And so as a result, any, uh, like any number of his teams at his large organization could have been using Nginx or IIS or Apache or any other of the other ones, these all have their own syntaxes for how they log their HTTP logs. And so you can't really expect to query all of them the same way and end up with the right HTTP uh, status code results, for example. The other, another problem, rather, that his organization would have been facing is that each team will actually customize their logging uh, habits uh, based on their own custom needs or their, their history of needs. And so even if they were all using Nginx, uh, well, they'd still run into the same problem. And a third problem that they'd run into is the fact that each team will actually have their own naming conventions for the same stuff. They'll all, I mean, one team might call it HTTP code, another one status code, another response code, payload code. Um, Kevin would have run into this and said, well, shoot, um, which one do I query on? Uh, and, and so it would have been much harder to get that aggregated view across all the teams. He would have to know which team uses which naming convention in order to actually get to uh, an understanding of the health of his, of his HTTP uh, responses. Now, fortunately, Kevin's organization is able to take advantage of the centralized processing pipelines of Datadog in order to solve these problems. Now, from the very beginning they were very of, of the logs product, they were very excited to see that they were able to just sort of send their logs to Datadog, and from within that centralized UI, they were able to define how each log should get parsed out into rich JSON content rather than just a simple string. Um, and especially, they were happy to see that a lot of you know the a lot of the logs that they were generating, especially the HTTP ones, they came from from technologies that had integrations, and so the pipelines were already set up for them, which they can clone and then easily tailor, and they can actually. Uh, as, you, as you'll see here, they can actually test out the pipelines before they send logs and make sure that they can see how their logs are getting parsed out and processed and enriched the right way. Um, and they can iterate on these and, and change them uh, to make sure they can fine tune them to fit their needs in a matter of minutes rather than having to deploy these changes across, you know, across infrastructure that, that does the parsing for them rather than having to loop in other teams to make that, those deployments happen. Uh, it's much easier. Now the problem though that Kevin's very large organization ran into with many developer teams is that very quickly they ended up having over a hundred of these processing pipelines and especially as new teams start continue to clone the Nginx pipeline and further tailor it time and again it became more and more ambiguous as to well when I want to modify how my logs are being parsed out and processed and enriched which pipeline do I fix and change and um, well if I do make a change which other teams logs will I impact as a result um, Fortunately, they were able to start using this new feature that we've uh, released at Datadog of, uh, the ne of nested pipelines. You can actually now 
and they and they were able to actually nest their pipelines into a higher level uh, hierarchy, if you will. So that way, instead of just having one pipeline for every source or type of log event, uh, they were able to set up a pipeline per team. And within each team's pipeline, they were able to create a sub-pipeline for each type or source of log event. As a result, it's much easier now for them to, to effectively manage their, the processing of their logs uh, without having to worry or, or risk the possibility of one team uh, accidentally changing how another team processes their logs, and, and it's, it's much more easy for them to manage. Now, another feature that Kevin's organization, oh, actually, uh, and, and this is just a, a quick view of what it looks like for Kevin to, to actually um, nest one of these pipelines is very easy, just opening up the higher level pipeline and you can, he can uh, drag and drop from the right hand side uh, another pipeline into the, the higher level one. Voila. Now, uh, the other feature that Kevin's organization is employing in order to solve their, their larger organization uh, processing pipeline problems is this standard attributes mapping, which is also a new feature as well. Uh, now, Kevin doesn't know it because he is a new SRE, but before he came uh, to his organization, they went through great pains to establish a standard uh, naming convention for all of their log attributes. Why? Because they really wanted to remove any redundancy across their log attributes and, and along with that, any, uh, any ambiguity of, well, which HTTP status code attribute should I be querying on? Um, now, what did they do about this? They, they organized a cross-team committee and they all met together and decided these are the standard attributes that our organization needs and these are the names we should give them. And they planned engineering work across all of their teams to refactor how they log so that way they can be in compliance with their standard naming convention. Now, unfortunately, about half those teams delayed that work for one reason or another. And as new developers continued to join the organization, they continued logging the way that they were familiar with. And, the whole th and those, those new attributes that they introduced were not uh, com compliant with the standard naming convention. And so the whole thing sort of fell apart. Fortunately, with this feature, Kevin's organization was able to configure in their log management account uh, a, a, uh, their, their standard naming conventions for all of their logs within their, log con their, their configurations of their Datadog account. And then any non-compliant attribute, they were able to just tell it what it ought to map to. Um, and so they were able to, with that, I mean, regardless of which HTTP status code somebody is logging with, or what, what name for that, it all ends up just being the same attribute uh, rather than four or five. And so they removed all of the redundancy in their, in their facet panels. They removed the, the ambiguity of which one do I query on. Uh, what's really interesting about this, though, is that they were able to enforce this standard naming convention without any developer teams having to change how they log. Everybody just continues doing what they were doing before, and the, the log management tool just takes all the non-standard attributes and maps them over to what they ought to have been called. Um, and when a new developer comes in and uh, introduces yet another name for HTTP status code, whatever that might have been, um, the, to solve that, it's a very easy thing. You just open up the standard attribute, go over to, and you, you add that new word for it at the end of the, the, that synonym list for, for that attribute, if you will. Um, so it's very e easily solved. So with the, st the centralized processing, the, the nested pipelines, the standard attributes, um, Kevin's organization is able to accomplish this, the ability to very easily query across all of the 500 response codes across all of their services, regardless of what team actually generated that, that log and what their logging habits were. And so Kevin's able to very, very smoothly investigate whenever any one service has a, a spike or an increase in their 500 responses, he's even able to set up a monitor to make that aggregated query for him on a regular basis and tell him when there's a, an increase more than, than it should be over a bad threshold. 